Well, welcome to our Modern Online service. My name is Christopher Vaughn. I'm the pastor of Modern Worship, and we hope this service blesses you and that you encounter God in a new way as you watch today. If you're ever in the Frisco area, I'd love to invite you to come and meet us on our campus. Our service times are online. And if you're watching this online from wherever you are in the world, we'd love to know who you are. And so there is a registration link in the description today, and we hope that you'll fill that out. Maybe put a prayer request. We'd love to know um, who's worshiping with us online today. So I hope this service blesses you. I hope that you encounter God in a new way today, and I look forward to seeing you again online soon. Well, good morning, and welcome to Grace Avenue. Feel free to stand as you're able uh, as we worship this morning. Come let us worship our King. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at your feet. You have done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how your love overcomes. You have done great things. You have done great things Oh hero of heaven You conquer the grave You free every captive And break every chain Oh God You have done great things We dance in your freedom Awaken alive Oh Jesus our Savior Your name lifted high Oh God done great things been faithful through every storm been faithful through every storm you'll be faithful forevermore you have done great things and I know you will do it again your promise is yes and amen. You have done great things. Oh God, you do great things. Oh hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great And break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, waking alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. You have done great things.
every soul, every beating heart, every seeker with all they are. Come find hope in the love of God. All creation will join as one. Lift their eyes, see the love as one. Jesus, Savior forever and after. This is love. This is love. Jesus came to change our hearts and make us one. Let our voices rise and sing for all He's done. Our fear is overcome. Our God is love. Our God, our God is love. Sing every distance. Every distant and broken heart, every prayer, every outstretched arm, finding hope in the love of God. H to H, H to H, let our praises rise, all in glory for all of time. Jesus, Savior, forever and after. This is love. Jesus came to change our hearts and make us one. Let our voices rise and sing for all He's done. Our fear is overcome. Our God is. Good morning, everyone, and welcome home to Grace Avenue United Methodist Church. My name is Christopher Vaughn. I'm the pastor of Modern Worship here at Grace Avenue. And I'm Carol Petritus, the Modern Pastoral Intern. And we are so glad to be worshiping with you today. We'd love to know that you are worshiping with us. And so there'll be a link in the comments section this morning. If you'll click that link, register your attendance, let us know um, who you are, where you're worshiping from. We'd we'd love to know um, that you are here with us. There's also a place in the comment section to put prayer requests. Um, We would be honored to be praying with you, walking with you in the days ahead. 
We have some announcements coming up for you today. The first thing that we want to talk about is a Connect meeting. So if you have been joining us online or in person and you would like to know more about joining our church, this is a wonderful opportunity for you to come and meet with us next Sunday, May 1st from 6.30 to 7.30 here on campus at Tom Graves Hall. If you are interested in registering for that, you will see a QR code on your screen that you can just scan and let us know that you're gonna be coming. If QR codes aren't your thing, I will post a link in the comments for you to register that way. Or if you're just using your device and you can't point it at the screen, um, the link will be in the comments section as well. We um, have some exciting things happening this summer. Our summer camp schedule is up. And so um, if your child is interested in attending VBC, science camp, art camp, um, or Camp Grace, you can find all of the details about all of the exciting things that are happening uh, this summer at Grace Avenue at our website, graceavenue.org slash summer camps 2022. So go and check out all that information. All the registration is up. I know um, the youth have put out their summer mission uh, camp dates as well, um, and registration is live for that as well. So um, if you have a, a child or a youth, we have something for them this summer. Go ahead and check out the website for more information and details. Yep. Lots of fun coming up this summer. Um, Another thing that we wanted to mention to those of you that are joining us is that we have a women's group that has been meeting now for several months right here in the worship center on campus at Grace Avenue. We are really getting a good group of women together where we are sharing prayer requests, joys, and concerns. If that's something that you are interested in, we meet at 9.15 a.m. back in the coffee area. If you are in the area, we invite you to come to Coffee Talk at 9.15 a.m. on Tuesday mornings. Well, we have a red rose on the altar, and if you have been joining us for a while, you know that a red rose symbolizes a birth in our church family. And so we are excited to share with you the birth of Chloe Francis Fink. Chloe's parents are Erica and Austin, little sister uh, Adeline, uh, big sister Yeah, now, right. <laughs> um, was born uh, yesterday on the 23rd. Um, and so I hope you'll join us in beginning to, to pray for the Finks as they become a family of four um, and as they uh, start their their life together with Chloe. I know um, we are really excited to celebrate this with them as well. She is so cute, so we are so excited for them. Um, We have been dreaming about what our church is going to look like, imagining what our church is going to be in the next three, five, ten years and on into the future. And as we have dreamed, we have invited many members of our church to come in and to share what their dreams for our church might look like. Um, And we created an imagination station. These imagination stations, we invited people to come in and just film just a short, brief clip of what they were dreaming about for our church. So we wanted to share some of those clips with you this morning. This is our imagination station. I dream that our church will continue to be a beacon of love and acceptance in our community. I dream that our church will someday support mental health awareness. I dream that our church will someday partner with Grace Chapel and travel to Mexico to build a house. Help everyone and welcome everyone into the church. I dream of a church where everyone is welcome. I dream of a place we all can call home. I dream of a world where justice is flowing, with hope and peace growing, and God's will is done. I dream that our church will someday be a shining example of what churches could mean to a community in the world that we live in today. Lend some money to the Ukraine. Be able to help the homeless people get houses. I dream that the church will be a home for all of those in our community who don't feel like they have a spiritual home. I dream that our church will someday be a net zero church, a leader in the creation justice movement that will have solar panels creating our own electricity and we will recycle everything that we possibly can. I dream the church will be someday a place that everybody can come here to worship and it will be a peaceful place for everyone. My dream for Grace Avenue is that we continue this journey that we've begun together, that we're open to the possibilities that the world presents for us, and that we truly pray and open ourselves to God's will. 
I dream that Grace Avenue will be a place um, that's known in our community as a safe place to land, a place where all will be welcomed without judgment. Make it so. someday our church will have the diversity. We have a lot now, but may God bring all the people to join together that love Him. I dream the church will continue to be a safe place for my family and families all around our community. I dream the church will be a place where the name of the Lord will always be paramount and be foremost in everything that we do have money for the people and also have donations so people can be free and have what they want to have. Heal the ill and injured. I dream that our church, Grace Avenue, will continue to outreach to others, that we can provide service, provide food, provide English language. My dream for Grace Avenue is that we will continue to show Jesus' love by reaching out and supporting the marginalized people in our community. Make it so, make it so. As we have talked and dreamed about grace upon grace the last several weeks, the one thing that we keep inviting you to do is to, to pray this prayer, God, what do you want to do through me? And we have been in what we kind of call the, the silent phase of the campaign, where we are dreaming and praying and really thinking about what we might have to offer. And now, this morning, we are moving into the, the public phase of our campaign. I have the Wolvertons here with me this morning. The Wolvertons are um, two of our campaign chairs for Grace Upon Grace. They are um, incredibly wonderful members of our church. Um, and they're going to talk to us a little bit about Grace Upon Grace, our goals for the future, um, and the success maybe that we've had so far. So, Wolvertons, I'm going to pass the mic to you. Thank you, Christopher. We have been working with our leadership team for the past three months to secure advanced commitments. And I'm excited to tell you that we've already surpassed our first goal. As of this morning, we have 95 families who have made their commitments for a total of $1,648,034. We, uh, we just want to take a moment and first of all say thank you from the bottom of our hearts for those of you that have been involved in the advanced commitments and to say how much we appreciate your overwhelming generosity. Now, if you haven't had the opportunity to be a part of this, uh, no worries. You're going to join us next Sunday at our Commitment Sunday in which you'll be able to make your commitments to this campaign. We, uh, we are just so overwhelmed with everyone's support and 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 belief in where our church is going and what we're trying to do. Uh, but for this week, we just want you to do two things. One is we want you to just pray the prayer that Christopher just said, God, what do you want to do through me? And the second thing is, today is a day to celebrate. And so if you're sitting at home, I want to encourage you to get up and get dressed after service and get up here and celebrate with us come rain or shine. We're going to celebrate what God is doing through us in this church. We thank you. Thank you, Wolvertons, for all of the work that you have done and will continue to do as part of this campaign. We are so excited that we have already met our first goal. Our first goal was to try to raise $1.5 Our goal over the course of the next week is to see if we can hit our um, 
ultimate goal, which is two and a half million dollars. And so I hope that you will join me in giving to the campaign. I, my household, Caitlin and Benjamin and Hattie and Audrey and I are, are part of that advanced commitment um, in dreaming about what our church can be for the future. Um, and so I, I hope that you'll continue to pray this prayer. If you've got questions about the campaign, if you really want to know what we're doing, pick up that campaign guide or um, give me a phone call or shoot me an email. I'd love to be talking with you about this campaign and just how excited I am for what our church is going to be doing in the future. And now I hope that you will begin to set your space for worship as we prepare to light the Christ candle. If you can grab a candle and a lighter at home, we invite you to connect with us as we light this candle, reminding ourselves that no matter where we are, we are connected across the distance in God's grace and love. And now if you'll please join me in saying our community values, we recite these each week to remind us who we are and what we believe as a community. Here in Modern at Grace Avenue, we gather as a unified community from all walks of life. Without exception, we belong. We affirm and embrace people from every race, ethnicity, age, economic status, marital status, gender or sexual identity, ability or faith background because all people reflect the face of God. Without exception, we belong. We seek to embody God's grace and justice in our community and in our world, and we recognize that historically the church hasn't always done that. Part of our work together is to help right some of those wrongs. Without exception, we belong. In this space, we bring our full selves. We engage our minds, we struggle with our doubts, we cultivate sustainability, and we carry one another's burdens. Without exception, we belong. And now let us continue to worship. You sing this song with me. You sing, formed in your image, filled with your breath, given your spirit, rescued from death. Formed in your image, filled with your breath, given your spirit, rescued from death. The joy you bring in everything fills our hearts with praise. Grace, we're covered in grace. Let's lift up your eyes. The God of love is calling out your name. Unspeakable grace is living your heart. And all the gift of grace and palm grace. Surrounded, surrounded by beauty, you're making us new, strong in our weakness, you carry us through, the joy you bring in everything fills our hearts with praise and grace. of your eyes the God of love is calling out your name speakable grace just open your heart and know the gift of grace for every heart for every wounded soul Up your eyes, the 
God of love is calling out your name and speak of grace just open your heart and all the gift of grace
scripture today comes to us from Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. Hear now the word of the Lord. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon, and about three o'clock he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and found another standing around. And he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat." But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. During the um, pandemic, I uh, discovered TikTok for the first time. And I discovered TikTok because I had a a student in crisis who was posting some videos that their friends were worried about. And so they said, have you seen these on TikTok? And I said, no, I don't have TikTok. And they said, okay, well, I think you need to to get on it and look. So that's, that's how I got to TikTok. What I then discovered is a a wealth of creative people on TikTok, which is why I stay. And recently, I saw a saga of a man who became just super agitated by the price of eggs in his area. Eggs had gone up um, a lot, and, um, and he was just really frustrated, and he noticed that he had some friends in his area who uh, had begun to raise chickens, right? And they had eggs for free every morning. And so he thought to himself, you know what? I could do that. So he he decides, I'm going to raise chickens. So he goes to the store and he uh, brings all the supplies that he's going to need to build pens for these chickens. It's chicken wire and two by fours and posts and metal stakes. And we watch the saga play out as he then begins to build the pen. And when it's all said and done and he picks up his phone to celebrate all of his good work, he'd done a great job. He was really proud of himself until he realized he had made one big mistake. He had trapped himself inside the pen. He had made no exit. He was trapped in a prison of his own making. Many of us can hear that story and honestly say, "Mm, I've been there, I've done that, I have that t-shirt. Is this man's experience with his self-made prison maybe a parable for us today? Do we have fears or attitudes or problems or weaknesses that imprison us? Or are we free to fully live with joy and excitement, enthusiasm as God intended for us? Are we able to celebrate our lives? Or are we trapped in a prison of our own making? Over the next six weeks, we're going to be looking at some of the seven deadly sins and really talking about how as we walk in the footsteps of Christ, we move from those sins into the seven virtues. 
And this morning, we're going to be talking about the sin of envy and how when we look at the things around us, at people around us, at lives around us, and we want that, we're unable to truly live into what it means to be followers of Christ. Because in order to be followers of Christ, we have to be able to move into the opposite of envy, which is celebration. And so as we prepare our hearts and minds for the message this morning, let us pray together. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. You ever wonder where the phrase green-eyed monster comes from? The green-eyed monster refers to someone who is motivated by jealousy and envy. The first recorded use of this phrase is from Shakespeare. During the Renaissance, it was common to associate feelings with colors, and envy and jealousy are associated with green and yellow, most likely because green is the color of bile. The phrase occurs in two of Shakespeare's plays in Othello. Lago tells Othello, "'Oh, beware, my lord, of jealousy.'" It is the green-eyed monster which doth mock the the meat it feeds on. And it's rather ironic because Lago is warning Othello not to trust Othello's wife when it's actually Lago who cannot be trusted. The first time Shakespeare uses the phrase green-eyed jealousy is in The Merchant of Venice, where Portia states, How all the other passions fleet to air, as doubtful thoughts and rash embrace despair, and shuddering fear and green-eyed jealousy. So what is jealousy? What is envy? Envy is defined as the desire to have a quality, possession, or other desirable attribute belonging to someone else. And jealousy is the reaction you have to feeling like you're losing something or someone. Psychologists describe the the difference between envy and jealousy using people. Envy is between two people. One person feels as if they're lacking what the other has. Jealousy is between three people. The first person is afraid of losing the second person to the third person. Envy is a powerful motivator. There are some psychologists who suggest that the first kind of envy, there are two, malicious envy is the one that often leads us towards sin. Envy gets into your mind and it causes you to want what another person has and you want them to suffer. Cinderella's stepmother is envious of Cinderella's beauty and charm. The stepmother goes to great lengths to prevent Cinderella from meeting the prince. And the Lion King, Scar is envious of Mufasa and kills him to gain the kingdom. Can you tell I've been watching a lot of Disney movies lately? Benign envy is the other kind of envy. It's not often seen as a hostile kind of envy. Instead of wanting bad for the other person, benign envy simply says, your friend got an iPhone, you really want an iPhone too, and if you were acting maliciously, you might steal that iPhone. But benign envy just motivates you a little bit to work harder and save your money to get the phone until you have it as well. The challenge with that kind of envy is it often leads us down a destructive path because we want sometimes what we cannot afford or we want what maybe we shouldn't have. So where does that come to play in our scripture today? Where do we see this play out in the kingdom of the vineyard? Well, if you were an ancient theologian, you may have read this passage allegorically. You would, you would look at it and you would look at the, um, those who are hired at different times of the day as representative of the different generations of Israel, such as Adam and Moses and Abraham and in the last hour, the Gentiles. Others have interpreted the early workers as Christ's original disciples, citing Matthew 19 where they say, look, Lord, we have left everything and followed you. And the latecomers are recent converts to Matthew's congregation. In either case, what is primarily at issue is whether God behaves justly, particularly toward Israel and the Gentile church. Another theological question has to do with the human potential to earn merit, typically addressed in terms of faith and works. Matthew writes for a a mixed congregation that includes both longtime Jewish Christians who may have also known Jesus personally and others who have recently joined, many of whom are Gentile converts. 
regardless of the particularities of, of Matthew's own congregations, he is speaking to the abiding question of God's relationship to Israel as well as the struggles between religious people who see themselves as doing the lion's share of God's work and those who do not seem to be carrying their weight. Hard-working, good people have always asked what kind of God would offer the same reward to those who have earned it and those who have not. And the tradition has consistently answered this, a just God. For this to be true, the workers have to recognize the opportunity to work in the vineyard. Whether that vineyard represents Israel or individual virtue or the, the church or the cause of justice in the world, they have to recognize the opportunity to work in the vineyard as the gift itself. There is no room for human pride since only one choice is either to answer the call to work in God's kingdom or to stand idle and waste one's life. This parable is about the gift of being invited to do the kingdom work of God. And in order to do that, I think we have to really recognize, one, that it is a gift. But two, there are then three things, I think, that we have to try to avoid in order to move from envy, like the workers at the beginning, into being able to celebrate God's justice in our world. Now, the first is we, we have to avoid the trap of comparison. The comparison of wanting what others have, yes, but also the comparison of self-righteousness. Uh, often, uh, when I talk to people, used to, to use the, the phrase and terminology, right? Um, comparison is the thief of joy. When you begin to, to compare your life to somebody else's life, then you really begin to steep yourself in the sin of envy. You really begin to want what they have, or then you do the opposite, which is to justify your own behavior because you just aren't quite as bad as those others. When I was doing student ministry, there were often times where I would look at some of our students and be like, please don't talk to each other like that, right? Don't, don't say those kinds of words, right? And they would say, oh, Christopher, you, you have no idea, right? Compared to the kids at school, I'm a saint. You just don't know. So there, there's two traps of comparison. First is the, the comparison of wanting what others have, yes. But the other trap is the comparison of our own self-righteousness. Like, mm, you know, I'm, I'm not as bad as that guy. You know, that, that, that person, I've, I've watched their lives and she's not all that. I'm, I'm way better than she is. But if we're really living into the gospel, the only person we're supposed to be comparing our lives to is that of Jesus. And we're trying to walk in the footsteps of Christ, moving from a place of envy into a place of celebration of others. It's not about how much better we are than everybody else. And this was the challenge that the disciples were having, the struggle that we see from Matthew 18 on. Matthew 18 begins with the disciples saying, hey, Jesus who's going to be the greatest in your kingdom, right? Like out of all of us disciples, who's, who's, who's going to be the greatest? Who's done the most for you? Who's doing the best here? We need to know, what's the model of success? What are the check boxes that we need to hit? What are our goals? And Jesus reproves them, right? And then they, they then move again, and, and they, they say, okay, well, Jesus, like, surely you don't, I mean, you talk about this grace and love thing, all right, but um, there's got to be a point, right? A, a stopping point, Right? Can we talk about that? Okay, like how many times does somebody sin against me and then when, when we reach a point, like what's the number? Can you quantify it for me, Jesus? What's the number where then I can go, okay, I don't have to forgive you anymore? And Jesus tells them, truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so you shall forgive 70 times seven, which we've always taken to mean an infinite amount of time. And then you continue until you get to this parable of the laborers in the vineyard. And we see what the grace and justice of God looks like unfold. And we know that too often we get caught like the, the workers, caught like the disciples, wanting to know who's going to be the best, wanting to know what we're going to get for following God. And there's a, there's a trap there. There's a challenge there because it doesn't allow us to celebrate what God is doing in our own lives because we always want what somebody else has. So we're never appreciative of what God has given us. And the second piece is we, we, we get so caught up in thinking that we are these perfect people. 
when in reality we are just as broken just in different ways. So I think the first thing we have to avoid is the the trap of comparison. I think the second thing we have to avoid is that trap of wanting. It's so easy for us to look at the world and just want what other people have. You go and visit somebody else's house and you see, man, they've got a pool in the backyard and they've got a media space. They have a lot of room for their kids to play. Man, it would be nice to have a bigger house. Or somebody's got a a really just nice car. Maybe it's your dream car, something you have always wanted and desired, and they've got it. Or maybe it's even simpler. Maybe you just really want the, the love that somebody else seems to have, the joy that somebody else seems to have. You see, envy is one of the oldest motivators in the Bible. Cain envied his brother Abel because God favored Abel's sacrifice, and Cain killed Abel out of envy. Thou shalt not covet is one of the Ten Commandments, and in Dante's Purgatory, sinners who are guilty of envy have their eyes sewn shut with wire. This is because they have received pleasure from another's misfortune. Abraham sent Hagar and his son out into the wilderness over Sarah's jealousy, and Jacob's sons sold their brother Joseph, their own brother, into slavery out of envy, out of jealousy. Jacob's wives envied each other, and Leah could have children, and Rachel couldn't. The Pharisees and Sadducees were jealous of Jesus and the apostles, and they killed Jesus out of envy. You see, we have to avoid that desire of wanting more because that that envy, that jealousy often leads us to do things that cause irreparable harm to other people. Sometimes we see that harm unfold and sometimes we don't. But when we are truly walking in the footsteps of Jesus, we are not wanting what others have, we are content with what we have. And Jesus is constantly reminding the disciples of this and constantly reminding us, right? Do not want for anything. Instead, just like my father takes care of the flowers in the fields and the birds in the air, how much more precious are you? And how much is my father going to take care of you? You see, we we want, want, want. But in wanting, again, we miss the opportunity to celebrate what God is doing. We miss the opportunity to celebrate what God is doing in our own lives and in the lives of others. We miss the opportunity to see God when we steep ourselves in envy instead of living in celebration. Third, and finally, we we have to avoid the trap of earthly understanding. I was having a conversation with a coworker about this scripture, the laborers in the vineyard, and they were adamant that they, they really just relate to the workers. It's hard to look out and, and see God's justice if everybody gets the same thing. And I, I just always imagine the way that this must have looked, right? I, I, I try to envision what this might have, have played out like in, in real life. Arrogantly, the day laborers are marching on the householder, and they are fussed at him, and they, they criticize him, and they, they berate him. They challenge his goodness. They begrudge his generosity. They might even curse at him a little bit. And then you get this response right? Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Are you envious because I am generous? Right? That, that kind of self-righteous, haughty attitude that those workers had doesn't fit in God's kingdom. The, the, the world has been greatly inspired by the life and teachings and ministries of Jesus. We see it every day. But what we also see is a fundal, fundamental misunderstanding often. You see, this, this parable is about, one, the invitation to come and work with God, the invitation to come and be in the kingdom of God. But I think too often we, we look at it and we, we miss what this parable is all about. We think about it in terms of earthly terms, right? If, if we had a, a job and a, and a boss and, and we worked for them for 15, 20, 30 years and, and we were getting ready to retire and the guy who worked for one year who also decided to retire, got the same retirement package as us, we would go, oh, no, that's unfair. And we'd be hard-pressed to talk about the fairness of that. And yet that's not the point of this parable. 
The point of this parable is that God's love, God's grace is available to all. No matter when you come to the kingdom, no matter when you begin the work, God's love and God's grace is available to all. That's what this parable is all about, the gracious, unconditional love of God. And the point for us is clear. God is generous and kind to us, and God wants us to be generous and kind to one another and to everyone we meet. When we really look look at this parable, it's a parable of life. It's a parable of not being envious about what others have because we want it but instead being able to turn and truly celebrate that all have been welcomed into the kingdom of God, to celebrate that the love of God is available to God, and that no matter where we come into this life, that the love and grace of God that connects us to God allows us to move our lives in a new way. And so this morning, may we let go of envy. May we let go of wanting. May we let go of that comparison trap of self-righteousness, and may we let go of our earthly understanding, and may we live into the justice of God that allows the grace of God to come into our lives, and may we celebrate. May we celebrate what God is doing in our lives, may we celebrate what God is doing in our church, and may we celebrate what God is going to continue to do as we truly begin to walk in the footsteps of Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in prayer. God, we are grateful for your abundance and for all you have generously given to us. We ask that you help us lay down our envy so that we have the opportunity to live the life you dream of for us. God, sometimes we get so wrapped up in the idea of needing to prove ourselves as good enough to others that we lose sight of everything that matters. Help us to avoid the traps of comparison and jealousy. Lord, teach us to turn our eyes to loving your people. We pray for our neighbors and that you may draw near to them today and that they can feel loved by you. God, for every injustice, fear, and pain those in our world suffer this morning, we ask that your comfort be near them and that we may represent your light in this world, free of anything that might hold us back from this work. And now let us pray the prayer your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We now have the opportunity to give back to God what God has so generously given to us with our time of offering. At Grace Avenue, we are always seeking to live into our mission statement, which is to eradicate homelessness in whatever form it presents itself. To do that, we've redefined what homelessness means. We believe, yes, that everyone needs a physical home, a roof over their head, food, water. But we also think that everyone needs an emotional home, a place to feel supported, especially in the midst of this pandemic where so many are struggling with a variety of different um, things. We want to provide a system of support for you. And we believe that everyone needs a spiritual home. So I forgot the last home. Um, We believe that everyone needs a spiritual home, a place to come and to worship God and to feel connected to what God is doing. We at Grace Avenue are getting ready to gear up for our summer lunch program. May is coming. Next Sunday is May 1st, and beginning on June 1st, we will begin feeding children every week from June 1st to August the 5th. Our summer lunch program serves the residents of Preston um, on the Lake and Little Ant, 
Little Elm. Um, and we um, really and truly are excited about this mission and ministry that we've been doing for almost a decade, where we feed um, these children in the summer. We'll feed over 100 kids um, almost every day um, this summer. So um, your generosity helps make that happen. We um, also need volunteers for that ministry. So really begin to look at your calendar this summer. Um, help us come out, serve food to the children at Preston on the lakes. We now have the opportunity to give generously to God. There'll be a link in the comment section. There is a QR code, um, but may we give back for what God has done in our lives. All my words fall short I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do Every song must end, and you never do. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much. I'm nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing Hallelujah, hallelujah I'm a one response I've got just one my arms stretch wide I will worship you On my soul, so oh, come on, my soul. Don't get you sound me, lift a pure song. You got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, oh come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get sound me, lift a pure song. You got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul. Well, oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. You got a throw up my hands so I throw up my hands and praise you again and again cause all that I have is a heart 
It has been great to be with you in worship today as we lift up our hallelujahs to God, as we think about what it means to come and be those workers in the vineyard. And so as we go forth, let's go forth with this blessing and benediction. May we learn to celebrate one another. May we look at each other not with envy and want and self-righteousness, but instead of celebration of one another's accomplishments, celebration of what God is doing in the lives of others, and celebration of what God is doing in our own lives. And as we begin to walk in the footsteps of Christ, may we really and truly begin to live out what it means to see God at work in us and in others. May we go forth with a spirit of celebration, being able to see what God is doing in our lives and in our church and in our community. And may we go forth with the blessings of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And wherever life takes you this week, I hope you find your way back onto Grace Avenue. Amen.